Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Mothballing the Coliseum changes at Overton Park and remembering Burnell Smith tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Toby Sells, news editor at the Memphis Flyer. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Eric. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. Uh, we'll talk about, there's a whole lot of news going on. I think the lead story, though, Bill, is the proposal, which we'll get into more next week with, with Paul Young from the city of Memphis when he's on the show. But the, the city has started to roll out its plan for the fairgrounds, and that includes the Coliseum. And I think for a lot of people, the Coliseum's the headline because the mayor's proposal, and you, I'll let you fill in the details, is essentially to mothball the Coliseum. Not tear it down, but also not put the money into it from this TDZ, this Tourism Development Zone, um, that some people wanted. So t tell us about the Coliseum situation, then we'll go into some of the other parts of the plan of the fairgrounds. Right. The, the, the city, um, the administration of Mayor Jim Strickland says that they really don't see a, a, a plan at this point that they want to go down the road on and start operations and, and, and actually operating the Coliseum again as an active venue plays into this because the city said before we do that, before we have this ongoing expense, we want to make sure we've got the best plan. And they're just not sure that being part of a youth sports facility or complex on the fairgrounds is actually the direction that they want to go with the Coliseum. There might be some other direction. So for the interim, until they have time to devote to that, they're going to concentrate on some other parts of the plan. And much to, I think, a lot of people's surprise, a lot of those other parts are not on the fairgrounds proper. They're outside of the fairgrounds boundaries in the neighborhoods around it. Uh, Orange Mound I I is what comes to mind immediately. There's, there's an access issue there because there is a railroad yard between the fairgrounds and Orange Mound to the south. Well, the city wants to improve the entrances that go under the railroad yard into the neighborhoods. It also is going to explore using old Melrose High School as some kind of facility that's connected to what happens at the fairgrounds in terms of youth sports tournaments. But, but, but the really big philosophical thing here is that the city is trying to balance hosting these tournaments, which bring in a lot of money and a lot of people from out of town for regional and national sports and amateur tournaments with everyday use by Memphians. Because right out of the gate during the Harrington administration and into the Wharton administration, um, they made such a push about these tournaments that it created this backlash among Memphians who were saying, well, okay, you're, you're doing this for other people who come here, not not for right. Memphians. And the, 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 this youth sports, I mean, it is its own business. And, and people with kids who've had, had kids play in these competitive leagues, what jokingly called you know professional sports by some, um, it's expensive. There's you travel baseball, travel volleyball, travel soccer, and you go around from tournament to tournament. And that's what they're talking. They're talking about a, on the old Liberty Land area. Is it $80 million? As much yeah, as $80 mm -hmm. million, dollars, yeah. they, they, don't, they don't have a vendor yet. There's still a lot to be filled in. Right. But that, that seems to be, they're all in on the youth sports and, and what that will do in terms of bringing people and tourism dollars. All this is based on the TDZ. And we talked about, I think, last week in terms of the downtown TDZ, which is sales tax money that goes to the state that otherwise would stay with the state coffers, but comes back. Is that, do right. I have that right, Bill? To, yeah, to finance the development, the public part right. of the development. Right, so downtown they're using it for things like the riverfront, things like the, you know, um, the pinch district, all kinds of things down there. That's what they're talking about here. And they've always, to tap into that money, they've always had this challenge of, well, we've got to do something that's going to generate new sales tax dollars, because mm -hmm. that's what you get. You get the money that is new over and above the baseline. So the youth sports, we had Ken, Kevin Kane on before talking about all that. And it is interesting that 40 million, they've earmarked it, Toby, for the neighborhood. So mm -hmm. Cooper Young, Orange Mound, Access. 
I think that's different. As Bill said, that feels different to me than things we've we've heard before. What was all about what's going to be on the fairgrounds. Certainly. This is more about at least an effort to integrate um, the, the the whole all the neighborhoods, integrate the fairgrounds into all the neighborhoods, and vice versa. Right. But it's still going to be a tightrope to walk, I think. To Bill's point, uh, you know, the entire project is $160 million. Half of that is just for that exclusive playground over there for these travel teams uh, for the youth sports facility. Um, and, you know, at this point, we're still reading the tea leaves because the final plan doesn't come out until Monday. And maybe after that, things will be a little different. But uh, just kind of connecting a few dots that came out this week. Uh, earlier this week, Mayor Jim Strickland was talking about how much money it costs to be on these travel teams, how much money they might bring in. Uh, so there's already kind of shows you how, you know, how much income you have to have to play these things. And then uh, with, uh, on Wednesday, Paul Young was talking about it. And he said that, you know, we do want more access uh, for people in the surrounding neighborhoods, but said specifically that the youth sports facility would be you know, out of bounds for neighborhood kids. So it's not really unless doing anything on unless they're on one of those teams. Yeah. So it's not that part. Half of the entire thing is not doing anything directly for the kids in Orange Mound or Cooper Young or Beltline. Right. So, you know, if we're in a state now where we're talking about, you know, we're fighting for tens of thousands of dollars for inclusivity on Beale Street for the Beale Street Bucks program, you know, and they're proposing $80 million yeah. of exclusivity over there uh, for, for the fairgrounds. It's going to be a, a careful debate to watch. Yeah, and, and for people who don't know, I mean, um, I would say person, my, one of my children did um, travel volleyball. I mean, it was, a, it, was, it was a lot. I mean, sure. it was a couple thousand sure. bucks just to, to be on the team, and then you travel, so you're staying in hotels, and you're going to restaurants, and that's what they're trying to tap into. Mm -hmm. We did it one year and only one year. Um, but people do it, and, and it is a big business. I mean, there, and, and there is a sense that, well, we're missing out on that. What that could then f fund, and people like Kevin Kane from the Convention Visitors Bureau and other advocates for this have said, is it then fund, helps to fund the, the infrastructure. It helps to fund things like, well, you know, they're going to put hotel, we're going to put maybe a little bit of retail on the Central Avenue part. Um, and, and again, Paul Young alluded to, to be fair to him, and again, he'll be on the show next mm -hmm. week, he alluded to amenities that would be for the neighborhood, sure. that it would not just be an exclusive, Absolutely. exclusive, uh, exclusive youth sports facility. And I, I think you're right. I think, and we'll know more about that youth sports facility and who's going to run that and what details of the business plan. We'll know that, I think, in December. Is that right, Bill? Right. Yeah, yeah. They're doing a pro forma on, on, on all of that. They have an expert, a consultant, who's, who's come in to work with him. So it's a little later time frame. They won't have that in until December. That will influence the proposal they take to the State Building Commission to actually activate the Tourism Development right. Zone, and they'll, they'll, that'll be in Nashville come January. And let's come full circle back to the Coliseum. And you, and Toby, you and I were, and some other folks were on a tour, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Coliseum Coalition, a kind of an advocacy group that mm -hmm. has put out a full business plan, has, put, has been you know, arguing for, we've had Chooch Picard and others on the show over the last few years, that the, the Coliseum be renovated. Um, they were very disappointed in this plan in right. the sense that it, it did not take any of that TDZ money and put it into the Coliseum for all the sort of ideas that they've put forward. Um, it does not, however, tear the Coliseum down, which was a fear of other people. Right. I mean, the, the, if there's a middle path in this, the city seemed to try it. And, and basically, they said it was partly economic, um, it, 8 to $10 million to tear down the Coliseum. The city has it at, what, 30 to $40 million to, to renovate, truly renovate yeah. the, 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 the Coliseum. The Coliseum Coalition thinks that can be done for more like 20, 25 million. But instead, for $500,000, they repair the roof and they kind of mothball it and they essentially push the decision down the road. Right. And, uh, you know, like you said, it's a middle ground. Uh, when we were in there, it looks like somebody held an event in there uh, a year ago and walked away. Uh, I'm no structural engineer. Uh, it looks solid. It looks safe. But, uh, again, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of all that stuff. The coalition, those folks, they seem to think that, uh, you know, it, it could easily be uh, brought up to ADA standards and everything else. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see, because Paul Young said yesterday that he wants to work with them, you know, to come up with a business plan, to come up with a plan for the Coliseum. So it'll be interesting to see if those two groups actually get, uh, get together and, and come up with a solution. It also gets in, and we've talked about this and we've obviously written about it, you get back to the Grizzlies, Bill. And the Grizzlies have this right 
um, and I'm going to screw it up, but basically, uh, uh, you know, they, they're, they've got in their deal, their uh, agreement with, for the FedEx Forum, that any facility more than about 5,000 mm -hmm. um, seats, anything over that can't be built with public money without their permission. Did I say that correctly? Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, and, and, and there are some differences on the interpretation of the exact Thank language. Yes. Is it a right of first refusal? Well, under, under the, the working interpretation that the Grizzlies seem to be using, it, it's more than that. It's no, you, you can't right. do a, a venue that is 5,000 seats plus. And this so, came up when, when Elvis Presley Enterprises proposed and then pulled back from a proposal to do an arena yeah. um, that would be you know, around 5,000 seats yeah. at, down so by this, Grace. This is, this, this is not people saying, oh, there's that language, we better not cross that line. This is, this is right. someone who's actually had experience with the Grizzlies saying, we're enforcing the, right. the, the agreement on it. So it, it, it played some role. It, it was out there, but the city's position is that um, that is not what has been driving the Coliseum plans ultimately, that, that there does need to be some downsizing of it. But by the same token, they're not necessarily sold on the idea of a 5,000 seat venue for sports tournaments that would have maybe three courts in the Coliseum, right. mm -hmm. which is not enough for, right. for, for one of these tournament sites, but you build an annex onto the Coliseum and then you have even more courts yeah. there. And they've talked, I mean, it, it is, I mean, Toby, to go through, and I know you've gone through there too, Bill, but we just so happen to do it together. I mean, their enthusiasm, their, their, their love of that place, mm -hmm. the memories of bands that were there, these, this were the dressing room where Jerry Lawler would get ready, this is where the Beatles were. I mean, you do kind of, I mean, I honestly sure. kind of got swept up and I, I would love to, you know, you, there's a party, part of me that says, oh my gosh, there's so much history here and, and people have all these memories of first concerts and best concerts and so on. Right. That then pushes up against the hard realities of, does the city need another arena? Does it fit with the youth sports? Right. And who's going to, is the city in the business right now, even though it's TDZ money, of putting 30 or $40 million towards this other arena? Yeah. It, it's, a, it's such a tough one. It is. And the, you know, the coalition has always said that we're not in this for nostalgia. You know, this is, right. this is a big amenity. You know, there are a lot of memories here and, and a lot of folks have great memories, but, uh, you know, we're in it for kind of historic preservation. This is a great solid building uh, that could be good for Midtown and could be, you know, for, for greater Memphis. Uh, and that's the reason when they came up with their business plan, they said, you know, we, it's, it's mainly youth sports. It's for graduations, you know, concerts, all those other things are kind of secondary tertiary, you know. So, so they're trying to build a business model, not to say that we're in this thing because we have such great memories, but, you know, it's yeah. something great here. All right, more on that again. Paul Young will be on next week um, to talk about that and other things going on with the city. Um, we'll switch to Overton Park in the, the biggest sense. I'll go to you, Bill. There's a whole lot going on. Um, as always, I have to you know, note that I am currently on the board and chair of the board of the Overton Park Conservancy, which is a part of the park, the, the forest and the green spaces and the greensward, certainly. Um, but there's a lot of news. Um, mm -hmm. This time, you know, it doesn't really involve the conservancy. It doesn't involve the zoo. <laughs> it involves the Brooks, which I don't think we've had a chance to talk about on the show. But people know that the Brooks has proposed, is looking at this move downtown. Uh, we talked about it with, with, um, with some folks, I think, last week and with the mayor um, uh, recently. That um, moving downtown to a site where the fire station is overlooking the river, a really, you know, sort of transformative big project. Um, leaving behind the facility in Overland Park. And then, what, a week or so ago, uh, Memphis College of Art, it had been rumored and had been talked about, uh, announced that they're going to close their doors. They're going to finish out kind of the, the, the students who are there. It's a two-year wind down. Um, they just have found, uh, I mean, uh, your article, I read articles in the flyer, I've seen the statements. <clears throat> it's just not, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a business model that's working for them. Yeah. So, so, what what's actually happened, and I never thought I would see the day, but the issue of zoo parking has actually <laughs> taken a, a, a backseat in all of this. So, meanwhile, the plans for for that zoo expanded parking area are are taking shape, and that's moving forward. At the same time, the conservancy is, as you know, has has embarked on a park master plan, just in time for the Brooks. Um, surfacing with the plans to leave the park and they're talking with the city about a riverfront location and then added to that the memphis college of art um, two very iconic buildings in, in in the life of overton park two very iconic institutions in, in in the history of the park so there are a whole world of possibilities that now open up 
with this and, and a whole series of discussions. Uh, you know, what, what happens with, with what I call the marble box that has been the only home that the Brooks Museum ha has, has ever had in its 100 years of existence? What happens with the Memphis College of Arts building that was, has been the home of, of that institution since the late 1950s that was designed by Roy Harover, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a very it. familiar looking uh, design done by an architect who's, who's done a lot of landmark work here in the city. Yeah, Toby, your thoughts on all this? Well, the just the other thing is that uh, the your city of Memphis General Services is gonna move out of that southeast lot over there, and that's gonna free up, what, 16 acres of parkland on that corner too. So, you know, last year, if we were on this show, we would've been talking that there's no space, zero space at Overton Park whatsoever, and then all of a sudden, there's all these things opening up, and it's just, a, it's been kind of a wild ride to watch, and it's gonna be a really interesting, challenging future, I think, for, for the leaders of the park over there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how they're doing it. But uh, who could have imagined that the Brooks and that MCA might have, right. have been looking to leave? And MCA, too. I mean, they're, uh, they're like a lot of these kind of colleges around. You know, it's not just them. It's a lot of these small art colleges around the, the country having the same issues. And, and part of what hit them was a combination of things. A recession certainly hits mm -hmm. in the middle of this. They had expanded. They bought a building downtown on South front, um, that South Main, South Main mm -hmm. thank you, that was where they had their graduate programs. They then had moved, pulled back from that. That's about to be turned into a hotel, but they built, excuse me, they bought um, some housing along Poplar on what, what would that be? The South side of Poplar. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fair amount of debt. And, and I think that was part of the problem. And then they had a pretty, they did not have the student population or the admission population to support the debt. Um, I think they'd gone around and tried to look at some partnerships and so on. And then finally the board made the, the tough decision to, right. to, to close it down. And, and, and there are some possibilities. I, I, I think the one that has been talked about the most and it, and it came up pretty much immediately at, 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 as soon as Brooks made its decision to, to uh, move toward moving on the, on the riverfront is a, 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 that the, the Brooks that's left in the park, the building, may be the home for an Eggleston Museum, which we've certainly heard a lot of mm -hmm. discussion about over the years, a museum uh, with the archives of, of the photographer William Eggleston in it, right. which had been talked about going onto the city maintenance That's yard right. once it's cleared out on the East Parkway side. Well, suddenly you have several possible <laughs> sites right. for that in the park. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we'll move on to some other news there, and, and again, we'll, we'll do another show. I mean, you, we're, you're writing, everybody's writing about it, and it is interesting with the with everything going on with the buildings. So the last thought for me on that is the amount of rumors and then the conspiracy theories on social sure. media. I mean, it is interesting to to have been through through the, my work with the park and some off the record conversations. There's there's more of a plan than it sometimes seems, I think, publicly. Mm. But um, but it is obviously it's a real shot to the to the gut and the psyche when when two institutions that like that look like they're just up and leaving simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We'll move to elections. We got, um, it, it is an election year next year, Bill, and it's, a, it's gonna be one that's a pretty big deal between the governor's race, now the Senate race is gonna be a big deal with Corker dropping out, um, and we've got local county mayor race that's looking more and more interesting. Uh, I, where do you wanna start? Um, I, I'll, I'll start with the local uh, races, the races for, for, for a county office, because those are the races that are now starting to come to life. Between now and Thanksgiving, a lot of these candidates in these local county races are coming out and saying, hey, I'm declaring I'm, I'm running for this, because what they're doing is getting voters' attention at this point before the holidays kick in. And then on the other side of the holidays, they'll be back and start what I call the hand-to-hand -hand campaigning. <laughs> you, you can't pull out you, you can't pull a qualifying petition until uh, a couple of weeks from now. Uh, and the primaries for the county offices are in May. So that's kind of the timeline that we're dealing with. August is the primaries for the state and federal offices. And uh, you're gonna see some very spirited local races. Um, there are all kinds of, of, of theories and axioms about, about what having a race for governor and a race for the U.S. Senate, two statewide races on the ballot means, which party does it, does it benefit. Um, Basically, you are going to see a pretty heavy influence of what's happening in Washington on these elections and the nature of, of 
how the two parties go about those races. And part of that, I mean, that could reflect back on these local races is if, if former governor, Democratic governor, Bill Bredesen gets in the race for Senate. Right. right? That is, and Democrats are out there hoping, 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 right. because one, he's, he's a very wealthy guy, mm -hmm. so he could put a lot of money into it. He's got name recognition and positive numbers with independents and even some Republicans. Right, and, and at this point, it's just being bandied about. He's not said uh, one way or the other. He said, I'm gonna leave it as a, as a prospect and kind of left it on the table. Uh, but that's left uh, some others in a holding pattern. I know Andy Burke is, is the mayor of Chattanooga. He's kind of pulling back uh, to see what Bredesen is gonna do. Uh, and, uh, um, but, you know, they look at his numbers. They look, I was reading this morning, uh, in 2006, Bredesen won all, a Democrat won all 95 counties in Tennessee, uh, and that's just unheard of these days. And, uh, you know, he's, he's 73, he's been out of the spotlight for a little while, and if he came back, that would really shake up that race and, and, and show any sign of life at all on the Democratic side. On, on the other side of this with the Republicans, you have what shapes up to be a pretty fractious race in the Republican Senate primary between uh, Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn and former Congressman Stephen Fincher. Uh, and, and you have two very conservative candidates in that primary, but very different kinds of conservatism. In, in the governor's race, you have a six-way race in the Republican primary, and there are already some sparks among several of the contenders in that as well. So pretty lively on, on both sides of this. Actually, the, the Democratic primary for governor appears to be kind of the most placid of right. the contest mm -hmm. we're Carl talking Dean, about. The former, the former uh, mayor of Nashville is pretty far ahead. Of most re I'm looking at results from MTSU, did a poll recently. He was very far ahead of Craig Fitz, who, fra who's a uh, uh, the uh, House member, the state House member from the Jackson from Ripley. West Tennessee. Ripley, the, thank you. The Ripley. closest thing to a, a, a Memphis contender right. in any of these races. But there was, again, to this MTSU poll, I mean, you talked about the six people for Republicans for governor. You've got Diane Black, you've got Beth Harwell, um, you've got Randy Boyd, you've got Mae Beavers, um, Bill Lee, and I'm probably leaving somebody out there, but all having, you know, the, this poll just looked at, do you have positive views of them? They were all you have name recognition. Um, it, it was interesting. It's going to be a tight race. They're doing forums now, right? Um, yeah. They've started doing some debating, some forums. Um, that will heat up, especially right after the first of the year. Yeah, they've, they've done two where you've had all six there, and, and you really have a lot of different views yeah. on this. And, and, and you have a lot of sparks in particular between Diane Black and uh, uh, between Randy Boyd. Yeah. Uh, in that race, that'll spread out over right. time. And you've got, somebody pointed out to me, you've got the whole dynamic, we talked about the national influence, when Donald Trump is tweeting, who, you know, maybe Evers is probably more in the Donald Trump camp right. of conservatism. She's a, a Senate, uh, a state Senate member. But he was tweeting very positive things, I think, recently about Diane Black, who's the Republican conservative House member from somewhere around the Nashville area. From Gallatin. Gallatin, mm -hmm. thank you. I mean, th that Trump enters the race on some level in Tennessee. Absolutely. And, uh, and it'll be interesting to watch. And, you know, if you want to look at the county mayor uh, election, even, you know, when you've got Terry Rowland, who was his guy, and, and was he the overall West Tennessee? Tennessee. Just West Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, heating up that race. And a lot of folks have that right now is kind of Terry Rowland and uh, Lee Harris uh, and then probably David Lenore, you know, but uh, Terry Rowland is certainly the far right care, uh, uh, contender in that race. Uh, and Jackson Baker was writing that that race could get shaken up later with some other shoes to drop. Uh, he wrote this week that maybe Shea Flynn would run as an independent, maybe Harold Byrd, the Bank of Bartlett president. Uh, so there's still, yeah, a lot of shoes to drop uh, this and season. And Lee Harris, got, did we say that already? Sorry if you did. Lee Harris, the yeah. Democratic, uh, used to be city council, now state senator. He declared on the Democratic side, which is also in. Yeah, right. he, he's, he's been running for three weeks. He's now doing fundraisers. And in fact, he told a group of supporters uh, this week in Victorian Village that, that uh, the, the, the Trump model for government, which he described as break things, 
uh, is is going to be a heavy influence yeah. on, on on what happens in that race. <clears throat> and last here, just with a couple of minutes left, um, I think people maybe have seen, we, we made note of it on last week's show because we had pre-taped that show. We couldn't get a full segment. And Vernell Smith, who is the uh, publisher of the Tri-State De- Defender, um, a frequent uh, a member of this roundtable when we would do these roughly once a month, passed away. Just, uh, just a tragedy. I was shocked. I think everybody was shocked. 45 years old. Um, three children, um, w- wife. I mean, it just it was just so awful uh, and so shocking. Uh, thoughts, Bill? Um, well, I, 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 think, I think his contribution, first of all, in, in resurrecting the new tri-state defender, um, you know, people who aren't in the business, I, 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 don't, I don't think know what, what, a, what a big achievement just that was. But he, he also took his place in what I think all of us have been trying to do in the last 10 years or so, and, and that is um, push ahead this new reality in print media in this town, and that there's no longer just one dominant voice about the way things go and the way things ought to be. Uh, editorially, there are many voices, and all of us have been a part of that, and Brunel really helped to, to uh, bring that new day closer. Toby, thoughts? Oh, I just love what Bill said, and I, I believe every bit of it. Personally, I met him right here on this stage, and I've gotten to know him over the years. I admire the way the man thought. He, he thought clearly, spoke clearly, and sometimes uh, unabashedly. Sometimes he was unafraid to, to get out there and say things that needed to be said. He is missed. Yeah, it, it is to, to what Bill's saying. I mean, this this model of, of you know, um, he was an advocate publisher, and he was very much, I mean, it didn't matter where you, you Burnell was everywhere. I mean, yes. you'd see him at business mm-hmm. events, yeah. you'd see him at civic events. You know, he was listening, and he was um, a local guy. I mean, Rhodes graduate, um, and to be at his funeral, um, Natalie Chandler and I, the producer of the show, went. And it was an amazing celebration. His friends, and I mean, it was very sad, but it was an amazing celebration. But but again, and we tried to have Karanja Ajanaku, the, the editor of uh, Tri-State Associate Publisher. He could not. He, he wanted to be here, but couldn't do that. Um, but it is an interesting time in local media. I mean, local, local, um, um, the CA, I think the newsroom now is under 30 by uh, what count of someone right. uh, told me recently. So I, I think that is the model, as Bill said, that um, going forward, and it'll be interesting to see. But that is all the time we have. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.